Hi. I started bird watching when I was about 10 years old and never really considered doing anything else in, in my life. Uh, at this point, I'm unfit for any other kind of employment. <laughs> um, so bird watching, what first attracted me to bird watching was the incredible beauty of birds, their beautiful plumages, their intense and, 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 and diverse songs, their uh, um, extraordinary uh, diversity. Um, but over time, of course, uh, you start to become interested in the other properties of birds, which is the fact that some of them... Whew, some of them are quizzes. Some of them are hard to identify. And every bird is a mystery you have to solve, a riddle that you have to use your, uh, uh, your senses and go out to nature and find. Now, uh, a lot of people don't understand what, people, what bird watchers are doing out there in the woods and in the swamps. But really, bird watching is a hunt, uh, except the trophies are all in your mind. And uh, uh, fortunately, the mind is a great place to put your trophies because you carry them with you every, wherever you go. They become part of your life. They become part of uh, what you do. Of course, uh, um, uh, as a kid, what I wanted to do was see more birds, uh, the earliest bird of the season, the latest bird of the season. In fact, I wanted to see all the birds. In fact, I wanted to ultimately travel the world and see all the birds of the world. So the ultimate goal of birding is to populate your mind with memories of all the birds of the world. That's 10,000 trophies. This is a, a feat that nobody has accomplished yet, but, but uh, all the birds of the world are, are, are ultimately eager to do someday. Now, what's interesting about birding, too, is the sensory and cognitive experience. It's not like other sorts of things. Indeed, when you see a bird, you're going to have, a, like this beautiful black birdie and warble, you're going to have an amazing sensory experience. But birding is more than that. Birding is attaching the proper name to that experience. So that when you see this bird, you go, wow, that's a black birdie and warbler. And then you, you, you're naming it, you're recognizing it. We actually know this is true because functional resonance imaging studies of the brain of bird watchers show that bird watchers recognize birds with the same part of the brain that uh, the rest of people, not just other people, the rest of people use to recognize faces. It's not a face recognition module, it's an individual recognition module. And so bird watching is really about learning and training your brain to recognize individuals, all those different kinds of birds. So when I got to college, I realized that evolutionary biology was the part of biology that was about the subject that I found most fascinating, and that is the diversity of birds. How do they get to be so many? Why are there so many? Why do they look the way they do, and why do they live where they are? And I realized that this mental stamp collecting, this cataloging of personal experiences of birds, uh, was actually a, a great database for the study of birds, and that it was uh, my passion for birds transformed itself into a scientific research project on this uh, great uh, branch on the tree of life, the birds of the world. And indeed, I, I realize that natural history, the study of birds as they are in nature, is an essential part of science, and it's something that still informs my science and still informs my, my, my subject today. Now, since I've been studying, uh, watching birds for about 40 years and, uh, uh, and studying them scientifically for about 30, uh, I have studied lots of different things. I've worked on, uh, on display behavior and song, and I've worked on the little gizmo that birds sing with called the syrinx, and I've worked on anatomy and development of feathers and the color of feathers and the origin of feathers in dinosaurs and even the color of the fossil dinosaur feathers. And it goes, uh, and I've also had the, the, the pleasure to watch birds on uh, all around the world. But recently, I've realized that most of my research is about one uh, fascinating topic, and that's the evolution of beauty. And when I say the evolution of beauty, I don't mean the evolution of beauty to us. I mean the evolution of beauty to birds themselves, because the beauty of birds evolves because birds are beautiful to themselves. The way that happens is that birds regard one another. They have a sensory experience. They uh, have a, a, make a cognitive evaluation of that experience, and, and then they make social decisions. And of course, the social decision that's most critical is who to mate with. So uh, a, a lot of the beauty of birds is about sexual beauty. And by sexual beauty, I mean all the observable features that make a particular mate attractive and desirable. So birds have evolved mating preferences that select upon the uh, other individuals within the species to, to decide uh, who to mate with or to, 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 to choose a mate. And uh, this is a process that Darwin referred to as sexual selection by mate choice. And it results in the evolution of ornament, like the beautiful plumage of the uh, green broadbill here. 
So, um, um, so the question becomes, why do birds have the ornaments they do? Well, the first thing we notice is that ornaments don't, don't function in the real world, like, uh, like the beak of the finch. Uh, they don't uh, crack a nut or help a bird migrate or help a bird raise their young. They actually function through the perceptions of other individuals. Those subjective experiences of those other individuals have evolutionary consequences because they're making choices on, on the base of those experiences. So um, what that means is that we should expect that the plumages and displays and songs of birds should evolve in a different fashion than the beak. The beak of the finch cracks a nut, and there's a very finite number of ways to, in which uh, you can open a seed uh, with a beak. But to seduce another mind uh, is a, basically an infinite problem. And, and the infinite uh, varieties that, of both preferences and traits that can evolve uh, are what really give rise to the diversity of birds. So when we look at birds, we see 10,000 species, each one of which has its own distinct form, its own distinct way of defining what beauty is. And since birds are all descended from a single common ancestor, they've evolved 10,000 different ways to conceive of the problem of, of, of what beauty is. And actually, the scientific study of beauty should be the, the process that, that, that determines that. Now, when we look at the uh, uh, birds, the next question is, why do they have the ornaments they do, the specific ornaments, like this cock of the rock? And the answer is uh, actually easy to, easy to, easy to supply. The, the, the ornament should evolve to the preference, or should evolve to match the mean preference within the population. The real question in sexual selection by mate choice is, why does preference evolve? Why do individual species evolve to have different ideas about what beauty is? And here we have a scientific problem. And the problem is that most of my colleagues in evolutionary biology believe that uh, beauty evolves for those, pre or preferences evolve for those kinds of traits that communicate information about quality. That is that, according to this view, basically, uh, beauty is practical. It is um, uh, 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 utilitarian. It provides information that that females need to know. In this case, basically, beauty in the world is reducible to just another form of adaptation. So for example, here, this is a video by uh, Ed Scholes, uh, a, a former grad student of mine now at Cornell University. What we're going to see is a female superb bird of paradise visiting a male at his courtship log. Now, according to the majority theory of the evolution of beauty, uh, the display that the male gives is going to communicate to the female everything she needs to know. Practical information, like who are his people? Does he, do, does he come from a good egg? It, uh, uh, should I wear a condom? <laughs> is, he, is, he, uh, uh, is he going to uh, uh, give me a sexually transmitted disease? Or uh, it, 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 does he have a good diet? It, does he smoke? What is he smoking? <laughs> does, does, does he take care of himself? And in uh, species other than the superb bird of paradise, would be, the questions would include, is, she, is he going to take care of me and take care of my offspring? Right? Well, a, this view is very attractive to those evolutionary biologists who believe that the, that the goal of the, of, the, of the discipline should be to explain nature as a result of natural selection. But for some reason, for some reason, uh, this uh, explanation is both uh, insufficient uh, and, I think, uh, uh, unable to explain nature. Uh, I'm, as an evolutionary biologist, I'm a little ashamed to admit this, uh, but I think that adaptation is a little bit boring. Um, I know that natural selection is uh, ubiquitous and important and, and, and constant, uh, but I think there are aspects of nature that it's unable to explain. I think that frequently nature or evolution is a lot more quirky individual, uh, historically contingent, and complex than adaptation can explain. An evolution of beauty is a classic question uh, uh, to, to, to in this area. So uh, I'm actually proposing or, or supporting an alternative theory. And in this theory, uh, preference and beauty, the, the, the thing it desires, uh, co-evolve with one another outside or with absence of constraints from natural selection. And as a result, they co-evolve in, in, in a way like in a, a rationally exuberant market bubble. 
evolving off in do, new and different ways in all the descendant species. And I think this is actually a theory that's up to the task of explaining uh, the diversity of nature. Now, so is uh, the beauty of birds bristling with information? Or is beauty just stuff happening? Right? Is it uh, arising on its own, or is it the result of a deterministic process? Who's in charge here, Eros or Athena? Right? Now, in fact, uh, since it's science, we actually have to test this hypothesis. We have to determine it. And the critical feature here is that the, uh, the beauty happens hypothesis, as I will say, is really the null hypothesis. It's the idea that beauty evolves merely as a consequence of the existence of preference. Right? And that, they, that, it can, uh, that the beauty is, a, is, is, an, is, is, is the expectation, the null expectation, and that beauty, is, or that beauty will only be restricted to meaning when there is strong natural selection. So um, how would we know this is going to uh, be uh, occurring in nature? Well, there's a lot of science, a lot of uh, 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 behind this. But in, 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 in brief, what we can say is that the arbitrary, or beauty happens theory, is going to say that beauty is going to be highly diverse, much more diverse than natural selection should suggest. And that's obvious when we look at the plumage of birds are much more diverse than the beak shapes. Right? Uh, the, the, the diversity of entrancing a mind is much broader than the, than the, than the, than the, um, uh, the the physics of cracking a seed or capturing a bug. The other way we can examine it is to say that, uh, according to the beauty happens theory, um, the diversity of beauty should be extremely complex, that it should be excessively engineered. It should look basically ridiculous uh, compared to the simple uh, uh, sorts of traits that could communicate information. And lastly, the beauty happens theory uh, proposes that beauty can sometimes be decadent that desire can overwhelm practicality and result in traits that result in lowering the entire fitness of the species. That species can actually go extinct. Right? Now, um, I want to talk about an example. There's no sound. This is a bird that sings with its wings. It's called the club-winged mannequin. And it lives in northwestern Ecuador. And I'm just going to play that again. What you see, if you look carefully, is that its wing feathers are vibrating over its back to create this sound. This is, by any measure, a ridiculous way to communicate. <laughs> right? And what's interesting is that its ancestor had a perfectly good song, a perfectly viable vocal communication. Right. Why would you evolve such a thing? Well, I uh, saw this bird first in uh, 1985 in, in, uh, in Ecuador. And it took 25, 20 years to figure it out. And it was ultimately the work of Kim Bostwick, uh, my grad student now at Cornell University. Uh, and what you can see in this high speed video is that the feathers are vibrating over the back, uh, shaking and knocking into one another and, 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 and vibrating in this plane. So what's happening here is that uh, the wings are vibrating at about 100 cycles per second. But the sound is at 1,400 cycles per second. So we need a, a frequency multiplier of 14 to get the sound that the bird is producing. How can they do that? How does it work? Well, the hypothesis that turned out to be true was the one that I had eliminated as being outlandish uh, at, the, uh, at the outset. And that is that the uh, club wing mannequin is actually stridulating. That is, it's producing its sound like a grasshopper. What happens is that the, the secondary feathers, the feathers that are attached to the ulna, the upper arm, uh, are, are twisted and thickened into large clubs, which give it its common name. And the, fifth, the sixth secondary in particular has a big swollen tip with a bunch of knobs on the end. And the fifth secondary, which lies right next to it, right adjacent, is actually bent over with a fine, sharp blade. And when the feathers vibrate, the blade rubs, the blade of the fifth secondary rubs against the, the bumps on the sixth secondary, giving it a mechanical impulse which causes it to oscillate at this uh, brilliantly at 1,400 cycles per second. Now, when we, uh, and Kim Boswick in subsequent research has gone even further to show that in the case of club wing mannequin, beauty is not only skin deep. In order to get 
the males to make these sounds. Females have selected on anatomies which have actually uh, affected their whole internal structure. They have new connections to their wing muscles. And in particular, in this CAT scan, we can see that the wing bones are enormously changed. So here, in this illustration, uh, uh, Bostwick has compared the uh, ulna, the hind wing bone of the, of the, of the forearm, uh, to of the club wing mannequin to other mannequins. And you can see that in the mannequins there are thin, uh, simple tubular bones with tiny little bumps called quill knobs where the secondary feathers, the ones that oscillate, are, are attaching. But in the club winged mannequin, the entire ulna is thickened and twisted and has a big uh, planar surface with quill knobs or large bumps. And then if we look at the cross sections, it's even more bizarre. Instead of being hollow, the ulna and radius, the other wing bone of the club winged mannequin are solid, solid bone. This is extraordinary because every bird on the planet has hollow radius and ulna. This is the only species of bird with a solid ulna. So the selection by females to produce this elaborate wing song have resulted in dragging the species off of the optimal natural effective peak that all other birds share to create a structure which is clearly detrimental to its flight. Now these are rare birds. We, we don't actually have data on how they fly, but we can see that it's pretty damn awkward. And so as a result, I think this is an indication, a possibility of the evolution of decadence in this species. Right? Now, the real test will be what the female ulnas look like, and, and eagerly we're trying to obtain specimens out of old museum specimens to try to answer that question. But in this sense, I think what's going on is that this species has actually been affected by choice in a way that affects its fitness. Now, um, um, how will we resolve this? How much of beauty in nature is actually utility, and how much is irrational exuberance? Well, that's going to take a lot of science to determine. But in fact, it will never happen as long as evolutionary biologists are convinced and assume a priori that all beauty is about utility. We have to at least consider the possibility that beauty happens and that it is irrational and is exuberant and as unreasoned as our own sensory uh, experiences and emotions. Now, my real program here is to bring beauty back into the sciences as a legitimate scientific topic, as a legitimate study, uh, 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 a legitimate subject of our scientific study. What we need to understand is that the subjective experiences of animals, which we find so difficult to even talk about, actually have evolutionary consequences. And the result of that is extraordinary differentiation in the beauty in nature. And that's why I think we need to both bring beauty back and understand that beauty happens. Thank you very much.